Well, we're continuing a series that I started last week that will run throughout September, and the title of the series is Cultivating Healthy Relationships. How many of y'all could stand uh, a little more help in being healthy in your relationships? Certainly. And um, one of the things I believe the Lord placed in my heart for us as a church is that these years that we're in would be flourishing years for us. In fact, we're calling them the Flourishing Five. We're in the second year of that. And um, that we can flourish in five different arenas. One, we can flourish in our spiritual life. How many know that's the most important arena for you to flourish in? So you can flourish in your spiritual life, but also you can flourish in your physical health. How many believe your, your physical body can be strong and into, glo- into the glory of God? Amen. But also you can flourish in your mental health, in your soul, and have joy in that arena of your life as well. Um, but also that we can flourish in our financial life. How many of believe you can flourish in your financial life? And then lastly, and this is what we're tackling here, is to flourish in our relationships. To flourish in our relationships and experience really the best that the Lord has for us and even brighter days. Even if you're doing really, really well in your friendships or your marriage or your relationships with your kids or your coworkers, you can still take it up a notch or two and even excel even more so. And so there's probably a lot of like practical things and details that that we can get into and that I I will get into in the upcoming weeks. But I feel like last week and this week, we're kind of tackling some foundational things that are important for us to get in order for us to flourish in our relationships. And so last, last Sunday, we started with this real, real simple truth, and that's this. We can't flourish in our relationships if we don't value people appropriately. We can't flourish in our relationships. You can't flourish in your marriage if you don't value your spouse. You can't flourish in your relationship with your parents if you don't value and honor them appropriately. You can't, val- you can't flourish in your relationship with your children if you don't value and honor them appropriately. You can't flourish with your coworkers or friends or teammates or whatever it may be if you don't value them appropriately. And we see this truth really from the heart of God Uh, in the Gospel of John chapter 3 and verse 16. And you can turn there if you like. We'll put the scriptures on the screen. But it's a real simple verse of scripture. And it simply says this, for God so loved the world. How many are thankful that he did? How many all believe he still does? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God assigned value to humanity. The world he's talking about isn't necessarily the dirt and the mountains and the stuff that's in it. He's talking about humanity. God valued people so much that he wanted to redeem humanity, redeem people to himself. And he did that through his plan of redemption. And that's sending his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for the sin of humanity, to shed his blood for the remission of sin and to purchase our liberty and our freedom and to be raised again on the third day alive forevermore. And scripture makes it real plain, real simple. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be what? Shall be saved. That if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the lordship of Jesus, you will experience the salvation that God made a way for you to experience through his son. This is good news for anyone and everyone. No matter how much you have or how much you don't have, no matter what side of the tracks you live in, what culture, creed, no matter what your background may be, no matter what country you may be from, this is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. This is the, the good news. But God loved people. God loved humanity. And there's actually one place in Scripture in in 2 Peter, I believe it it is, that says that he's not willing that any should perish. Anybody. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all, somebody say all, but that all should come to repentance. That means the person that you like, he wants them to come to repentance. The person that you don't like, the person who's been pretty good, the person who's been the, the low down, dirtiest, rottenest person you can imagine, he still loves and cares for them and desires for them to repent of their sin, to believe on the living God and turn to Jesus and confess him as Lord and receive the life and forgiveness that's found in him. Anybody remember a time when you were a sinner and you were lost and you were on the outskirts? 
outskirts and you, two people, anybody, everybody else in here being perfect. Anybody remember a time when you were on the outskirts looking in, but by his amazing grace, by his goodness, by his exceeding rich mercy, by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, not by your own works, not by how good you have been, but by how good he has been through the righteousness that is found in him, through the cross, through the blood, through the resurrection, and through your faith in him, no matter how many bad deeds you may have done, you can stand in this church right here on a Sunday morning and say, I'm right with God because of Jesus Christ the righteous. I see myself how he sees me. I see myself washed. I see myself cleansed. I see myself brand new. I see myself a part of his body and his church. Whew, that's good preaching for a young white guy. Hallelujah. Amen. So what God did in sending his son is he assigned your value, and your value isn't based upon how much money you have. It's based upon what was done to purchase your freedom and your liberty. That's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're chosen by God, and God loves you. Now, I would like for you to turn to Ephesians chapter 3 because I want to get into this just a little bit further, and I believe this will help us when it comes to kind of getting a grip on all the details of all the things we're going to have to do and need to do in relationships. It'll help us to be able to do those things. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, the Apostle Paul's writing to the Ephesian uh, believers here. And he says this right at the, the start of, of this prayer that he's praying for them. He says, for this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice those words, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom, notice these as well, the whole family in heaven and earth is named. The whole family in heaven and earth is named. Uh, the Living Bible reads a, a portion of this this way, the Father of all the great family of God, some of them already in heaven, and some of them down here on the earth. Talking about all the saints, all the Christians, all the believers, that there are some that are in glory. Anybody have some family, some loved ones, they're on the other side already. Well, they're still part of the family of God, but they're on the, they're on the other side already. Amen. But then we're a part of that family, but we're, where are we at? We're at 6101 Masonic Drive. We're in Alexandria, Louisiana today. We're on the earth, but we've got family in heaven already. My, my granddad, he went to heaven last year sometime, just really close to this time, and he was 90 years old, but he's in, he's in glory. Amen. So not, not too long ago, I could go visit him. He lived in Colorado. I could go visit him in Colorado. We could have conversations. I could call him on the phone. We could talk, and we could tell stories, and he played the guitar, and he's a cool guy, and I mean, I, I love just talking to him, being around him, being with him, but now he's in glory. So we're, we're separated for a season that may seem like a long time, but it won't be long. Hallelujah. I'll be in glory together with them. Amen. So you may have family or loved ones. We've got people who are, who were part of our church family who are in glory right now. Hallelujah. They're in, they're in the grandstands of heaven, but they're part of the family of God. And so even though uh, I have a natural father and I have a wonderful father. His name is William Mark Hankins. I love my dad. Amen. I also have a heavenly father. And my heavenly father is the Father God. The Father God. And it seems significant and important in Jesus' life and ministry to demonstrate that God was more than just the creator of the universe or all-powerful or all-knowing, but that he would demonstrate and even show us that God was a father God, a father God. And we see this a couple places in Scripture, uh, one place that's probably familiar to many of you. We see it right at the beginning of the, of the Lord's Prayer where Jesus is give, giving us an example or a way to pray in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9. How many of y'all remember this? Jesus said, in this manner, therefore, pray our Father in heaven. Our Father in heaven. I heard someone teaching along these lines about, about that time and when Jesus was teaching that. And he says, really, that was a prophetic type of prayer that he was praying that, that the Almighty God would be our Father, our Father in heaven. 
And then if you were to turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 14, 15, 16, 17, I love, I love that passage of Scripture. There's a lot of reasons for it, a lot of great teaching and instruction that the Lord Jesus gives about prayer and about the Holy Spirit and about abiding and, and all, of those, all those kinds of things, and it's all in red letters, so I like that. Um, but you'll find in that passage how many times that Jesus references his the uh, references God as Father and talks to him that way. In fact, if you were to look in the Gospel of John chapter 14 in your Bible, you'd find that I believe it's 22 times that the Father is referenced in one chapter. Imagine if you were one of his disciples and you're hearing him talk and you're like, man, we always thought of God as this big, sovereign, almighty, righteous, holy judge, which certainly he is. But now you're giving us another side to who the, who the almighty God is. And he is a father God. And if you were to look through John chapter 15, John chapter 16, and John chapter 17, you'd find in my account some 50 references to God as father and I'll, I'll give you just a few of them. I won't give you all of them, but these are direct quotes from those passages. You can go look at them for yourself later. These are what Jesus said. Come to the Father, my Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I go to my Father. Pray the Father. The Father will send the Holy Spirit in my name. I love the Father. I'm loved by my Father. I'm going to my Father. My Father is greater than I. I love the Father. My Father is the vine dresser. My Father's commandments. The Father loved me. Ask the Father in my name. My Father, the Father himself loves you. How many know that's good news? The Father is with me. And then in John chapter 17, it's more, he's praying there and he prays like this. Father, actually, if you were to look into John chapter 17, he lifts up his eyes and says, Father, just talking to the Almighty God. Wow. Father, Oh, Father, Holy Father, oh, righteous Father. So then Jesus is demonstrating and exemplifying the significance and importance of God, not just being some big almighty God sitting on a throne, but a Father God. So the, the Apostle Paul wrote it like this in Romans chapter 8. Are you also with me on this? Romans chapter 8 and verses 14 through 17. This will bless you. He said, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you, notice this, you received the spirit of adoption by which, uh, uh, by whom we cry out. We cry out? So not just Jesus crying out and praying to his Father, but Paul saying now we cry out. What do we cry out? Abba, Father. And the Spirit himself bears witness with, with our spirit that we are, it, we are what? Children of God. We are children of God. And if children, it's just like good stuff, on, you know, coming right after. And if children, we're heirs and heirs of God and join heirs with Christ. And if indeed we suffer with him that we may also be glorified together with him. Notice, we, we can call the almighty God, Abba, Father, God. That word Abba, y'all want to know what it means? Okay, one person, thank you. Abba, all right. It means father, but this is, the, this is the significance of it. It was a common term that expressed affection and confidence and trust. It signifies the close, intimate relationship of a father and his child, as well as the childlike trust that a young child puts in his daddy. Listen, it's personal, it's relational. It's intimate that God's not just far away in the universe somewhere, but God is not just a father God. He is my father God, and I am one of his kids. Let me show you another place. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7 says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption. We see that phrase again, the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out. What are we crying out? Abba, Father. 
Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but you are a son. And if you are a son, you are an heir of God through Christ. The Message Bible says we can talk to God like this, Papa, Father. <laughs> Papa, I'm not sure why this is, but every now and then Jude calls me Papa. That's my son. He's a 17-year-old young man. He's like, hey, Papa. I'm like, Papa? Where did this come from, Papa? <laughs> if you don't call me Papa, he goes, hey, Pastor. I'm like, okay, what are we doing now? <laughs> Papa, Pastor. It's okay. I like both. It's all right. Amen. Praise God. Now, in Galatians chapter 3, verses, is it okay that I'm giving you a lot of scripture today? All right. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 29, just one chapter before we just read. I want you to see this because it's very, very important. It says, for you are all sons of God. The next part matters, though. This is how. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. You're all sons of God. The next part says, for as, as many of you as were baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ. So now, uh, you're neither Jew nor Greek, you're neither slave nor free, you're neither male nor female, uh, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You are a son of God. How did you become a child of God? Well, he said it right here. How did you become a child of God? Through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, just bear with me on something for just a second because you need to know this. Everyone is God's creation, and God loves everyone, but not everyone is a child of God. Not according to Scripture. He says you're children of God, and this is how you got there, through faith in Christ Jesus. And when you put your faith in Christ Jesus, I said just a few minutes ago, when you believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth, what happens? You are saved, you're brought out of darkness, brought into the light. You are, what scripture says, is born again. And when you are born again, you are born into the body of Christ. You're also referenced, we're referenced as the bride of Christ, but we're born into the family of God. And now God is our father. And say, so, well, pastor, that sounds kind of rough. We say not everybody's a child of God. Well, if you just listen to Jesus talk, you'd find out real quick that he calls some people, he told some people, he says, you are of your father, Satan. Boy, if you had heard Jesus say that, you'd be like, that's not nice, Jesus. <laughs> Can you just round that off a little bit? That's a little harsh. We're losing followers. Offerings are going down. Something about Jesus, he could really draw a crowd, but he could sure thin one out too. Have the masses following him as he feeds them and heals and blesses them. And then he'd say something like this, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they're like, you know what? <laughs> Cross the line right there, Jesus. The bread was nice. The fish was nice. No comprende. That's a little weird. <laughs> You're all sons of God. Here's how. Through faith in Christ Jesus. In 1 John chapter 3, it says it like this. It says, behold, I love this. This is so good. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. But notice this. Beloved, <laughs> this is so good. Now, somebody say now. We are children of God. When? What are we? Amen. You can know I'm saved. You can know I'm in the family. You can know God is my father and we talk. You can know I've been brought out of darkness. You can know I've been delivered. You can know I'm saved. You can know I have his spirit within me crying out to the father. Abba, father. You can know that. You can know that. You can know you pass from death to life. You can know. A number of years ago when we were youth pastors, 
we were doing a survey, and we actually went to the Ash Alexander Senior High parking lot, and we were just asking teenagers some questions, asking about salvation, getting saved, how do you know you're saved, stuff like that. We asked them all kind of questions. This is years ago now. And, I mean, we had some teenagers come out, and they're like, you know, I don't know if you can know, you know, and maybe if you're really good, you know, you know you, maybe your good outweighs your bad. And, and, I mean, so we'd ask them questions. Do you, do you know if you're, you're saved? Do you know if you're going to go to heaven? And you get answers like this. I don't know if you can know. I don't know if anybody can know if they're going to heaven. And I have to say, no, you can know. And if you're saved, you should know it. Let me ask you a question. Anybody married in the room? Do you know it? I just don't think you can know. No, you said the I do's. You became family. Come on now. You know. And when you get saved, you ought to know. I'm not who I used to be anymore. I'm a new creation. I'm a new creation. Now, if God is our father, and he's the father of this house and this family, then he gets to set the boundaries. He gets to set the parameters. He gets to set the structure. He gets to set up the framework. He gets to set up the rules. He gets to make the commands. If he's the father of the, of the family, if he's the father of this family. And I realize not everybody likes God's rules, God's commands, or God's instruction, but it don't change them. You could have feelings about them. You could be in your feelings about them. But it doesn't change God's design. Doesn't change God's will. Doesn't change, his word does not change on it. No matter what anybody else says, no matter what the culture may be pushing or people may be pushing or what people's opinions or experiences may have been, it doesn't shift God in what his design and his plan and his will and his way is concerning his family and concerning family. He's the creator of family. And because he's the creator of family, he retains what you would call creative rights. Creative rights with it. Let me ask you a quick, quick question. How many of y'all like to play board games? Card, don't lie up in this church place. Card games. How many of y'all been to Marksville before? Don't raise your hand. I'm just kidding. Just, I'm just kidding. Some of y'all live there. Y'all live there. Okay, it's a joke. It's just a joke. I've been to, I've been to, but I, I went for golf. Golf and a buffet. Praise the Lord, really, both of those things bless my life. Now, I like, I like games. We have, we have a whole, like, closet of games at our house. You know, some of them we play, some of them we hadn't played. You know, one of the all-time great games is uh, Uno. Anybody ever heard of Uno? Anybody ever played Uno? Anybody think you know what the rules are for Uno <laughs> till you play Uno with other people? And they're like, why y'all making up stuff? Why are you making up? I have, you know, we have kids, three kids, and, and you know, you play Uno. It's like if they hang out with other people, come back and like, well, this is how Uno goes. You don't have to play the, you know, you, you can play three sevens in a row if you want. I'm like, that's not how I played when I was growing up. That's old way, Dad. Like, well, what if I play this draw four and it's coming to you? I can put three draw fours on top. And the next person has to draw 16. Unless they put their four on top, then the next person has to draw 20. And I'm like, y'all making stuff up. Like, this is ridiculous. I'm like, do you really want me to Google what the rule book says? Because the rule book says you can't do that stuff. Why are you just making stuff up? Why are you just doing it? Well, we go. So anytime we sit down and we play games or board games or Uno or with people, I'm like, all right, so what are we doing? Explain it to me in a way where we can all be on the same page. Anybody ever played Mexican dominoes? I like playing Mexican dominoes. It's so much fun. But it's the same kind of thing. It's like you get around people. It's like, well, this is how you do it. And this is how you do it. And it's like, man, it goes all kind of sideways directions and people making all kind of, I mean, making all kind of rules and making stuff as you're going. And it's like, woof, you want to cause a fight in the family. 
play Uno with the family. It's like, we're on vacation, but now we hate everyone in the family. It's like, <laughs> we've had it. We've been on family vacation before, and we're playing Uno. And when Jew was just a little guy, the girls, like, the, our, our, he has two older sisters. The girls, like, tag teaming up on him, like, draw two, draw reverse. You don't get to go do all that. He get all mad and stomped up the stairs. Do you remember that? I don't know if you remember. He stomped up the stairs, and he's crying. He's all upset, threw his cards. Come on, come on. You, any card-throwing people in the room, you're like, <laughs> any Monopoly people, you're like, forget it. This is ridiculous. I got real money. Who needs fake money? <laughs> any real money people, you're like, we ain't doing that. Jude went up the stairs. He's crying. We're all laughing, which that makes it much better. We're all, we're all laughing, and we look up there, and we see he, he comes back down the stairs, and he pokes his head around the corner to see what we're doing. <laughs> we laugh some more. <laughs> Sorry, son. You can tell it's affected him in a tremendous way. Well, when it comes to the father of this family and the instruction that we get through him and his word, it's a real simple house rule. For the family of God. And I want to read it to you in a number of places. In 1 John. And if you're looking for some kind of, you know, follow-up, work, homework, add something to your daily Bible reading, I want to challenge you to read 1 John this week. How many of y'all can take that challenge? Read 1 John this week. One chapter a day or read the whole book every day. Take you 10 minutes. Not long. But I'm going to give you a couple here. 1 John chapter 3, verse 11. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. 1 John 3, 14. We know that we pass from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Spiritual separation from God. You're not alive in him. 1 John chapter 3, verse 23. And this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of, of his son, Jesus Christ, and what? Love one another as he gave us commandment. I know when you think commandment, you think the Ten Commandments, but here we're getting a bunch in First John, aren't we? Just like one after the other of the same kind of thing being said, right? First John 4, 7 through 11. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God, knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love God. Who? One another. Some of the brothers and sisters, other kids in God's family. One minister said it this way. I thought it was so good. He said, one of the greatest things you can do for God is to love some of his other children. If you have kids, how many of y'all, anybody have kids or you have brothers and sisters, you know, all that? you realize that what I'm reading to you is real simple. It's real straightforward. It's really plain, but not always easy. Anybody grow up in a family where you had like a brother or sister, a couple brothers, a couple of sisters? You know, what that, you know what happens when you have a couple brothers and sisters? Problems. You know what I mean? Like I'm brushing my teeth. No, I'm brushing my teeth. No, I'm taking a shower. No, I'm taking a shower. No, I'm, I'm making a sandwich with the last two pieces of bread. No, I'm about to deck you right in the face. You are not. You know. You can, get, you can go all kind of directions when you got family and you're close. And the same thing can happen in the family of God. Did you know that? I mean, you could sit in the same building. And this is just a small representation, a micro representation of the big family of God in heaven and earth. Just a small. But I mean, you just get a small. You could have a church of 30 people and have a church split. I'm serious. You could have a church of 30 people like, well, we're taking our 10 over here and you can keep your... 20 over here, and we don't like each other. Can I ask you a question? What you going to do when you get to heaven? God is likely to plant you right next to each other <laughs> till you can work it out. 
So I, I just don't like people. Well, one, you are one. <laughs> if I'm honest with you, I think that may be real, the, the real problem sometimes is it's not people don't like other people. They don't like themselves. So you need to get rooted and grounded in God's love for you. Know who you are. Get that right first. And that's really significance. That's really significance of beloved love one another. It means the people who are loved, be loved by God, you've been loved. Be rooted in that. And now you can love other people with that same love. Amen. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. And we have known, I love this verse, we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. This is the God kind of love. It's agape. This is God's love. 1 John 4, verses 20 and 21. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is what? This is what Scripture says. He's a liar. He's like, not telling the truth. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him. We see in this word again, aren't we? House rule. Family rule. Before we get to all the meticulous details of how we're going to treat each other right and work things out and balance things, before we get to all that, if you don't get this right, yeah. it's just going to be struggle. Right, right. But if you get this right, we can work the other stuff out. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. This is taken all the way back to what Jesus said. He said, a new commandment I give to you. A new commandment I give to you. Here's the commandment. This is it. You've heard all the others. This is the command I'm giving to you. That you what? That you love one another as I have loved you. And that you also love one another. A scripture would go on to say in, in the book of Romans that you've heard of all the other things that you're supposed to do or, or not to do. Don't covet, don't murder, don't steal. You've heard all these things, but it's all wrapped up in this one command here to love one another and love your brother as you love yourself. That's it. That's it. I said, I said that's it. There's one trait in this family that runs real strong and real deep. Have you ever seen like certain traits that run in certain families, you know? Like when a baby's born, you're like, oh, you got your grandpa's ears. <laughs> have you ever heard somebody say that? You're like, no, that's the weirdest thing I ever heard in my life. How could they have their grandpa's ears? Grandpa's ears are this big and hairy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got your mama's eyes. Like, Really? Because usually after a few weeks, they change a little bit anyway. You know, say, so I don't know. Oh, you look just like your great uncle. I've heard people say that before. You look just like your great uncle so-and-so. I'm like, I don't think that's possible, but I can see it. Anybody ever seen somebody in a certain family, they all walk the same way? You know what I mean? Like, got the same kind of walk. Yeah. I, Danny says, I do. I mean, you can kind of see it. It's like, you just kind of, this is a trait in that family. You know what I mean? You can see it sometimes on, an, on a negative side. It's almost like, well, he gets angry just like his dad got angry, just like his grandpa got angry. It's like they all have hot sauce running in their veins. <laughs> just kind of natural traits, you know. But in the family of God, you've got a heavenly trait. Yeah. You got, and this is it, the love of God. Romans 5, 5, and I'll wrap this up here. Romans 5, 5 says, for we know how dearly God loves us because he's given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. When you make Jesus the Lord of your life and you receive him and you're born into that family, you're born into a love family. And that love by the Holy Spirit is in you. So now you have a command to love, but now you have a love that you can demand from to love others with. So when Jesus says you got to, you know, forgive your brother 70 times 7, you're like, oh, that's crazy. No, you can really do it. You got to speak the best about other people. Ah, oh, that's crazy. Yeah, no, you can really do it. You got to think the best about everyone. Oh, I can't do that. No, you really can. 
you got it in you to do it. This is what I found with, with a lot of people who don't. They don't want to. <laughs> like, I don't like house rules. I don't like that. I want to do what I want to do. And can I tell you something? And maybe just take it for what it is. You can do things your way. But you may not want the way they turn out. Because in the family of God and in natural families where people are saved, baptized, filled with the Holy Ghost and go to church, people can shut, shut each other out for a decade, not talk to each other till the next funeral, not go to Christmas together, not go to Thanksgiving together, ignore them, cross the street, change aisles at the grocery store. Y'all don't look at me like you're so holy. You'll know what I'm talking about. You know exactly what I'm talking about. We ain't going over to Aunt So-and-So's house. She's a witch. <laughs> We're not going over to so-and-so. When Mama died, we, we all fought over the stuff, and they got the stuff. Do you really want to fight over Grandma's Buick LeSabre from 1982? <laughs> and let that be the thing that ruins your family, ruins your faith, ruins your health, ruins your finances, ruins your future, and ruins your relationship with your children? No. Don't let it. Jesus said it this way. I believe it's in Luke or so 17. He says, offenses will come. That's not exciting. Somebody said it like this. I thought it was really good. Offense is a moment. Something happens. Hurts you. Do you wrong, treat you wrong, something. But offended is a decision. People, people will do things that cause offense. But whether you live there, it's up to you. So I just wish everybody treated me right. Can I tell you? Me too. But on the same page, sometimes I wish I did better treating people right too. And I missed it. I need their grace. I need their forgiveness. I need mercy from them and from the Lord. So I'm going to extend it. I'm going to sow it because I know I'm going to need it at some point. So the two things I wanted you to get from these past couple of weeks is one, we value what? We value people. Two, we're in the family of God together. We have brothers and sisters. And the love of God is the law of the land. If we get those things right, we can work through some other stuff. And we can do it together. Woo!